Welcome to the 700 Club Canada. I'm Brian Warren. And I'm Laurel and Tyler Thompson. It is great to be with you today. Mm -hmm. We've got a great show in store for you today. Thanks for joining us. You'll see how the prayers of faithful parents help save the lives of their children. Mm -hmm. Their stories are incredible on many levels, including how God can change any situation. Also in studio today, we have a special interview with Jared Brock one of our favorite guests, here to talk about his new book, I believe with you, Brian. Yes, it's called The Bearded Gospel Men. And um, I know you, you might be you, thinking about... You, you know, don't have a beard, well, but you are still a man of God. Well, you're absolutely right. Yeah. And, uh, so what is this about? <laughs> and I don't plan on growing a beard right now, just in <laughs> case you wanted to know. But not at me. This, is, uh, this is a great quote that he says, uh, my beard is not proof of my manliness. My beard is proof of my patience. Oh. You'll find out, but this wow. is a great oh. devotional for men and Jared Brock is uh, just a fun Well, he's guy. a fascinating guy and fascinating. he's been with us before. So to get us started in our first story, a young baby boy clings to life while his parents pray for a miracle. Take a look. Cheer jerker. Yeah. When Kristen Ann Zavino delivered her third child, Andrew, she and her husband, Bill, received shocking news. Well, the doctor came in and he said he's, he's not dead, um, but we do have to call in a life flight team. Andrew was born with partial DeGeorge syndrome, a condition that can have 180 side effects, including the underdevelopment of Andrew's pulmonary arteries. Their doctor offered them little hope. And he says, I'm not sure if he'll make it. And um, do you want someone to come in and do the last rites? I just laid there and I thought, I, I cannot believe you think you're gonna go in and have this baby and you're gonna be coming home with this little baby. I had two other little children at home. And I'm thinking, this cannot be happening. Bill was instantly reminded of a story from the New Testament and heard a voice speaking to him. Like a flash, I just remember the story of Jairus in the Bible where he was told, be not afraid, only believe, even though his child had already died. Fear not, only believe. I said, we believe. He said those words, and um, there was something about it that was scary, but there was also something about it that overtook your fear. And you thought, OK, He's going, to, he's going to make it. When Andrew arrived at Pittsburgh's Children's Hospital, the doctors discovered he had no left pulmonary artery. And when they come into the room, these two head cardiologists at Children's Hospital, and they just said, look, we've got good news for you and bad news to you, for you. The good news is Andrew is still alive. The bad news is he needs surgery now. He's only 14 hour old. Here's your options. We could bring him here into the room and let you hold him and let him die in your arms. Or we can take the, him into the surgery room and let him die there. Those are your two options. The Anzavinos opted for surgery, but continued to believe for their baby's healing. But I do remember thinking, OK, well, just do what you have to do. God's going to get him through this. And um, they said, you could come out and see him go through the hallway. And I remember going out, and he was in this the same little incubator, and I remember looking at Andrew and saying, Andrew, I am your mother, and you will live, and you will grow up, and you're going to have a prosperous and a productive life, and you're going to listen to me. You are going to live, and I'll see you when you get out. Andrew survived the surgery, but a host of other health issues began to surface. You know, it was one wave after another of bad news, so the next bad, bit of bad news was there was no thymus which means the immune system is like an AIDS patient, which means he can't fight off any sickness or disease at all. Still, the Anzavinos continued to believe for Andrew's healing, and Andrew continued to amaze his doctors. So within the first nine months of his life without an immune system, he overcame a staph infection in the heart, a Broviac line infection, then the chicken pock infection, and fourthly, the rotavirus infection without an immune system, which we believe was by the hand of God. You know, we would pray together, and we had this set of scriptures, and I he wrote these scriptures down on a piece of paper. I mean, there would be days that I wouldn't sleep. I would take out those scriptures that he wrote down for me, and I would just say them, and I would look at them as, this is medicine, and I declared it, and it has to work, it has to respond. Of course, Mark 11, 23 and 24, speak to your mountain, command it to go, and it will go. Um, the next verse, verse 24, believe you receive and you will have. But also Psalm 118, verse 17, that says, I will not die but live and declare the works of the Lord. Um, and then 1 Peter 2, 24, with his stripes, we were healed. 
Andrew's biggest hurdle, however, was the lack of a pulmonary artery. And so we said, Lord, they said he doesn't have one. We're asking you to give him one. And we believe we receive a left pulmonary artery for Andrew. And we started thanking him for that. And during the catheterization, they discovered that, okay, he's got a thread for a left pulmonary artery. And that thread is almost like the tip of a pin when it's supposed to be the size of a eraser, like a pencil eraser, and this artery is never gonna grow because where there is no blood, there is no growth. So for us to hear that it was a thread was exciting. For them, it meant nothing. But we believe that from nothing to a thread means the beginning of a miracle. At nine months, Andrew was scheduled for a catheterization to repair his artery. But prior to the surgery, one of the doctors noticed something unusual. He grabbed me in the hallway and goes, it worked, it worked, it's, it's the right size, it doesn't even need repaired. And I said, I know, I knew it was going to grow. Over the next several years, Andrew continued to overcome every obstacle he faced. Today, Andrew is a healthy 16-year-old who knows God has a special plan for his life. I really love to play the piano, and I go on my phone, type in YouTube, search up any song I want, and then just learn it from there. Like in the future, I like to play for a worship team, and I study God's Word all the time. He's a powerful witness for Jesus in school, and unashamedly does he share his faith, unashamedly. The Anzavinos tell his story in their book, We Believe. They were assuming he would die, and yet he's 16. I mean, we go to visit the doctor for our checkups, and they're like, he could just live as long as anybody else. They don't even know what to expect from him. They're, he's just a walking miracle. Laura Lynn, I could uh, really relate to that. Um, I've seen some of those situations personally. Right. Uh, where you, mm. you have such a celebration, and all of a sudden it turns into, oh my God. You know, I can't yeah. believe that this is happening. Right. And uh, even as Bill was talking about mm. Jarius and yes. the uh, the fact that his daughter was uh, was suddenly dying, and the exactly. woman with the issue of blood moves in before his daughter, and, and they give him the news: right. your daughter is dead. Right. So what Brian's talking about is there's this man Jairus, and yeah. his daughter is dying, and he sees yeah. Jesus, and he says, "Do something. Yeah. You know, can you help?" And then the woman with the issue of blood steps in, yeah. and and he heals her. Yeah. But while he's distracted with her, Jairus' daughter dies, yes. and it's a, a, a horrible moment. It and is. Jesus looks at him and says, "What?" what uh, this dad was talking about. Yeah. Uh, you know, she is not dead, just believe, don't yeah. be afraid. Only believe. What is it in your life that there is just such fear that it's too late, that yeah. God can't fix it, that this is dead? Will you dare to be that person who says, uh, you know, God, will you intervene in my situation and will you hear God's voice saying, just believe, yeah. just believe? And, and you know, when you find yourself in this situation, the first thing that you have to do is like Krista, stand on the Word of God. Wow. Begin to stand on the Word of God and begin to reach out to others as well. And we'd like to reach out to you and give you this pamphlet, it's called Hope. It doesn't cost you anything, but it will give you the, the scriptures, it will give you also the strategy of how you can make it through even in the face of very, very insurmountable circumstances. Call us now, one 855 700 and we'll get it back to you, get it to you as soon as possible. Mm. Coming up after the break, an accidental electrocution tests the faith of a farming family. Find out how and why they chose to trust God mm. after this. The soybean harvest was going as expected for Zach Short and his crew, until a call came over the radio that a combine had started smoking. When Zach arrived, he went to climb on the combine to investigate, but no one realized it had come in contact with a low-hanging power line. 12,000 volts of electricity shot through Zach's body. With Zach's hand still gripping the ladder, the crew used a plastic shovel to pry him free and called 911. PMS Shane Pearson responded to the call. 
The biggest thing I noticed right off the bat was his feet. His work boots had just kind of been blown open. He was in a very critical condition at that point. Zach was transported to the nearest hospital. At the time, his wife Jody was at home with their one-year-old daughter, Brindley. I got a phone call that Zach had been in an accident, and my first question was, is he alive? Because I had no idea how bad the accident was. And it was his mom on the phone, and she said she didn't know. Jody rushed to the hospital with Zach's parents. When you get to the hospital and you can just smell burnt flesh everywhere, it's pretty bad. Knew how bad it was. They told us that he was going to be flown to a different hospital. And that's when it really hit, hit us that this is, this is not good. Zach was life flighted to Vi Christie Hospital in Wichita, Kansas, and admitted into their burn center. Dr. Robert Bingaman was the attending physician. He had some of the deepest uh, electrical injuries I had ever seen. Both of his lower extremities were uh, severely burned, uh, actually, uh, areas on his feet and ankles were charred. The chances of living were no better than 50-50. Doctors put Zach into a medically induced coma and worked around the clock to treat his burns. Meanwhile, Jody and the rest of the family prayed and spread the word. I posted on Facebook and that's like the minute the prayer started. Doctors were able to stabilize Zach, but he was still in critical condition. Three days later, he went into cardiac arrest. The nurses um, pulled me in the room and the doctor while he was coding and they were performing chest compressions on him. And we were just behind him rallying, saying, come on, Zach, come on, Zach, come back to us, Zach. And, and, he, and then finally, the nurse had said, we've got, we've got a pulse. But as quickly as Zach's heart recovered, his kidneys began shutting down and his lungs started filling with fluid. The doctor told us he's not going to make it. He basically told us to tell him goodbye. So I took our daughter in and told her that he was going, going to heaven. Friends and family gathered at the hospital and waited for him to pass. They soon realized God was still at work. Blood pressure started to come up, and oxygen saturation levels started to come up. And then uh, he began to stabilize. The doctor said, I, th I think he's going to make a liar out of me. <laughs> I don't, I don't, he's getting better. God was, it was he's in the room with us. <laughs> he was there, and he was answering people's prayers. But there's no doubt in my mind that God touched Zach that night and, and turned things around and gave him a chance. Over the next couple of weeks, Zach continued to improve. His kidneys started working and his lungs started to empty and the doctor was just like, I've never seen anything like this before. Unfortunately, doctors had to amputate Zach's lower legs because of infection. It would save his life, but now they had another concern, whether Zach had suffered brain damage. The only way to find out was to bring him out of the coma. When I woke up in the hospital, it was like I had a whole bunch of dreams. I kind of knew what happened, but not really at the same time. And my wife was the first one to come in there. My first question was, do you remember me? And he, of course, he said, I'm not going to forget you and Brinley. <laughs> and then she said, well, you, you remember you, you got shocked in the field. And that's why right there it clicked in my head. I remembered exactly what happened. The next three months would be hard as Zach struggled through extensive physical therapy and multiple surgeries. I would definitely get angry and break down quite a bit. I just kept praying and, and thought, you know, there's, there's a lot of people out there that care about me. I have a lot to live for still. I just got to keep trying and, and God kind of show me the light. Then on Valentine's Day, Zach was released to go home. His town welcomed him in the streets. I couldn't believe it. I broke down when we drove through him because there was people out there with signs saying, we love you, Zach. He says, how am I going to thank all these people? And I says, you know, from what I can see, they want to thank you because you brought them back to their faith. Zach has become accustomed to his new legs and is thankful to get back to farming and being a husband and a father. In fact, 
He and Jody are expecting their second child, a boy. If it wasn't for all the prayers, God wouldn't have heard that we needed a miracle, many, many miracles, and we wouldn't have received the miracle that we got. You looked at what the doctor's reports were and how bad my injuries were, and there's nothing that explains my recovery, but you know, God watching over me. Wow, what an incredible story with Zach. We'll talk about that a little bit more, but I wanna offer you something that uh, you will really enjoy having in your hands. We all know that a healthy prayer life is a key to growing in your faith, but have you ever wondered how to pray more effectively and whether God even hears our prayers? If you wanna know how to pray more effectively and experience a new level of faith, then you'll wanna get your hands on a powerful teaching DVD answered prayer. In this latest release, Pat Robertson answers the questions that you have regarding prayer, and he shares remarkable stories about miraculous answers to prayer in his own extraordinary life of faith. Call now, 1-855-759-0700. Become a monthly partner with us, and we'll send you answered prayer right away. And speaking of answered prayers, is this not an incredible show today? We have seen a couple of stories where God has intervened. Why? Because people prayed. Why is it sometimes that we, we only pray when it's desperate? But what's good about God is that he hears our desperate prayers, that he answers the cries of a mother and father's heart when, you know, when their child or, or their son or daughter is in trouble. God is a faithful God. And you know, at the end, it, it, it just shows all things are truly possible. The word of God has been telling us this for centuries. If you've got a problem today, if you are facing an illness in your family, if you have have a, a marital breakdown, if you're going through a psychological issue where, where you're full of anxiety and pain, have you thought about praying? We're here every day to let you know that God answers prayer, that he knows exactly what you're going through, and he is going to get you through. Just trust him. Up next, Brian talks with author and activist filmmaker Jared Brock, live in studio after this. Prayer is a communication with God. He speaks to us and gives us help and direction. It's a powerful exchange between God and man. God is the source of wisdom. He knows everything. He knows the end from the beginning. He's the author of everything. And it is amazing how God will open up wisdom to you. Welcome back. We have one of our closest friends here at the 700 Club Canada, Jared Brock, and he's no stranger. Um, his last project uh, carried him over 37,000 miles around the world with a prayer devotional. And now he's back with the Bearded Gospel Men. Now, I know you want to find out a whole lot about that, so I want to jump right in. Jared, <laughs> it's good to see you here, buddy. Thanks for having me again. You know what? I, I enjoy every time we get a chance to spend time together, and uh, it seems like you never spend a lot of time in one place <laughs> because uh, right after we're finished, you're on your way to Wales, and uh, you've got uh, a, lot of, of, a lot of irons in the fire. Mm -hmm. Tell us about your first project and some of the things that you've been doing so we can catch the, uh, the audience up. Well, so I've made a couple of documentaries with my wife. So Red Light, Green Light was on human trafficking. Over yep. 18 was on pornography and kids getting addicted. My first book, as you mentioned, was a prayer pilgrimage around the world. Met yes. the Pope, went to North Korea, walked on hot coals. And <laughs> now I've written a devotional uh, with a good friend. Uh, it's called Bearded Gospel, and it's about epic dudes in Christian history that have inspired us. Well, you know what, and, and you said that I would use a bucket full of words to sp spread a, a spoonful of thought, but you'd encapsulate that really quickly. Jared, now, do I get an opportunity to uh, come into this bearded conversation? <laughs> you know, for, our, for the clean-shaven men out there, is, is this book for them? Yeah, yeah, so the key, word, <laughs> the key word in bearded gospel men is definitely the word gospel. Okay. So we actually profile a couple of women in this book, as well as some guys who didn't have beards, like C.S. Right. Lewis and J.R.R. Tolkien. We call them the beards that could have been. 
Oh, the beards it could have yeah. been. <laughs> <laughs> now, tell us what, what inspired you to, I mean, I, I love it because it's, yeah. a, it's a catchy book and, and it's a devotional and I love the pages as well because it's mm -hmm. kind of like old school if you look at them. You know, everyone has these very 13 inch beards and, and you see not only in, in Middle Eastern cultures mm -hmm. but also in different cultures around the world that facial hair is a, is a sign of dedication and also yeah. uh, a, a, a piety. Yeah, so our, the saying that we have at Bearded Gospel Man is that uh, true beauty is on the inside, but clearly our face has sprung a leak. <laughs> so yeah, um, basically me and Aaron, uh, Aaron been, had been running this blog for a while, my co-author, and um, as I had done my previous book, I had learned about all these greats of the faith, and when I'd look up kind of depictions or photos of them, they pretty much all had gigan gigantic beards, like a lot of follicle faithfulness, you know? Yeah. So that was the start of it for us. With all that follicle faithfulness, you know, you talk about uh, uh, lion food and, and, and loving it. Tell us, what, what, what in the world is that? Well, so basically we profile 31 epic dudes throughout Christian history. Um, one of them happened to be fed to the lions, and he actually volunteered. Uh, he was a martyr. Um, so basically, so Aaron wrote a day, I wrote a day, Aaron wrote a day, and we just worked through some of our favorite guys in history. So... Um, that was actually one of Aaron's, so you'd have to have him on the show to talk more about that. But okay, that's it's Ignatius coming. of Antioch, yeah. Yeah, but but something that you did say, and I, and I thought yeah. this was interesting, and, and it was one of the bearded men, and, and it was uh, probably one of my favorites out of this overall uh, book, and you're talking about how he was uh, determined to... to uh, to be martyred, but he said, but please, my beard didn't do anything wrong. <laughs> yeah, so so Sir Thomas More, uh, <laughs> the story goes that, uh, so he's he's to be killed, has his head chopped off, yeah. and right before the executioner brings down the axe, he pulls his beard to the side and says, this hath not offended the king. Yeah. That's, that's some clutch, <laughs> clutch humor. <laughs> not, yeah. not, not only clutch humor, but I mean, he was dedicated yeah. to the beard. Yeah, indeed. Now, what men... What would men really get out of this particular mm -hmm. devotion, and as well as women? Yeah. So, so the big thing for us is we're supposed to stand on the shoulders of giants, right? Yeah. And I feel like um, we're looking up at giants like dwarves. Like, the guys mm. who went before us seem so far ahead of us. And so my hope is that as guys and women read this book that they kind of weigh themselves and find themselves wanting, but also feel so inspired to be better with their time, better with their money, um, to love the world less and care about God more. You know, um, it's such a need. I know when I started off in ministry with Promise Keepers, it was calling men to a standard, yeah. raising yeah. the standard. And what you're saying now is we need to once again lift the standard. Absolutely. Yeah, there's, there's, we, we, men, we struggle with the same sins that we've always struggled with, right? Lust, love of money, love of fame, love of power. But now technology has made it so easy mm. to, you know, whether it's addiction to pornography or living it out via a hookup app or, or uh, you know, taking advantage of people because we just have so much technology to do that. We've got to realize that, yeah, we've always had these sins, but guys who went before us, they somehow found a way to put fame in its place. They converted it into influence on behalf of the least of these. They turned themselves inside out with their money. They were so selfless. Yeah. So, yeah, it's hugely inspiring for me. Give us some practical things as far as from, you know, someone sitting there. I know there's a wife saying that, you know, I, this is a perfect gift to give to my husband, mm -hmm. you know, and the bearded gospel man. But give us some practical things of what we can expect and, and, and what we need mm -hmm. uh, to really glean out of this. So I think the best way to do that is to just tell some inspirational stories of guys yes, in please. this book. So here's an example. Uh, there's a guy named Thomas Bernardo. He decided to start an orphanage for girls in the most dangerous place in London while Jack the Ripper was killing women. Wow. Super dangerous work. Uh, he raised tens of millions for charity. Uh, he started preaching in front of a gin palace until it closed down, and then he turned it into a coffee shop church. 150 years before that was a cool thing to do. And the charity that he started 150 years ago is still the biggest children's charity in the UK to this day. Wow. He made tens of millions of dollars, but every cent went back into his mission. Yeah. That's a man who understands that influence and affluence exists to serve others. And yeah. that, for me, just goes, man, what does my calendar look like? What does my budget look like? Because if I have to present both of those to God someday, yeah. whew, I want to make sure that I did the best with what I was called to steward. 
You, you know, you're, you're absolutely right. Uh, one of the things that we cannot uh, get back is our time. Yeah, time is all we've got. It's all we got. Yeah. You know, uh, you wrote about uh, uh, Mr. Kelper, uh, Kepler, and, uh, mm -hmm. and I thought that was interesting because the meditation was, the heavens declare the glory, uh, the skies pro proclaim the work of his hands. Uh, Psalms 19.1, quote of the day, the ways by which men arrive at knowledge of the celestial things are hardly less wonderful than the nature of these things themselves. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Johann Kepler, you know, like he, he discovers so much of the astronomy that we now practice, like he's this brilliant scientist. And for him, he called it his act of worship. Science was his act of worship to God. So every man has a different journey that we're on, yeah. but we like to see Beard of Gospel Man like a pub where you can come and have a conversation, be inspired. So we like to say, the fire is lit, the drinks are poured, welcome to the pub. Wow, you know, I want you to pray as we, as we uh, close out because I, I believe, like everything else, mm -hmm. uh, what you've done in the Red Light District, what you've done with the prayer journeys, that you're starting a movement. You're, you know, as a, as a Gen Xer mm -hmm. and, and, and it's going viral. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and I, my prayer is that men would begin to now capture a, a now uh, a, a devotional life yeah with God yeah. and begin to devote themselves to God, their family, and also yeah. the purpose that God has called them to. Would you pray with me? Yeah, let's do it. Yeah, for everyone at home, um, men, let's pray. God, we, we ask that um, you would make us care more about the things you care about than ourselves, um, that we would convert our influence and our affluence into useful kingdom things that every minute of our life would count. Lord, purify us. Um, guide us, help us to stand on the shoulders of giants. Um, make us gospel men. Amen. Amen. And Father, bless Jared in this project, and we pray that you would do once again a work mm -hmm. of raising up men across this nation and across this world, that their yes would be yes and their no would be no. Mm -hmm. Lord, please do a work, fan the flame once again, and allow that husband, that son, Lord, that brother, to begin to now understand his purpose, mm -hmm. Colossians 4, 17, and say to our kippers, remember the, the ministry you've received in the Lord. Take heed to fulfill it. Mm -hmm. Remember my chains, the Apostle Paul, in Jesus' name, mm -hmm. amen. amen. Jared Brock, thank you. Thanks. The Bearded Gospel Men, you've got to get it. It is a definite must and one of our great friends, uh, again. If you need more prayer or you need to, again, find out uh, what God is doing, one 855 700 Until next time, continue to pray. We're praying with you. God bless. To contact us, phone one 855 700 you can email us at cba at 700club.ca. You can now like us on Facebook and follow us on Twitter or Instagram.